All right, folks, today I want to invite you to take a look beyond our own noses, so to speak. How do people fight outside of Europe? Some styles that you perhaps may not be aware of or not familiar with. Uh, let's take a look at some Zulu stick fighting first, which is an interesting combination of weapons. You have the shield together with a parrying stick, which gives you a lot of defensive capabilities. Because not only do you have the shield to work with and defend against the opponent's attacks, you can also use a lot of the stick. With such excellent defensive capabilities, the question becomes, how do you get around the opponent's defense? And we'll see an example of that right here. Did you spot it? Let's look at it again in slow motion. So right fighter advances, the fighter on the left feints to the opponent's upper right and then changes it to a horizontal strike on the opponent's left, who responds. You know, he had his shield high and he tries to move it down to defend against that, but he catches him on the ribs before he's able to move the shield there. Meanwhile, he's got his own defense up on the left side where he expects uh, the opponent's track to come in and he defends again against another one i also quite like the the posture here if you look at this right here he actually has the shield right next to his head and which is the important part to cover of course and he crouches down as well to present a smaller target. So this way, if you cover high, if you just stand upright and you cover high, then you're exposing most of your body. Whenever you close one opening, you open another. You just cannot defend every part of your body equally. But you can make it a little more efficient by presenting a smaller target. Right, so left is playing it defensive. Again, crouches down to, to cover against that strike. Uh, right is a lot more open. And at this point, they have to grapple. So left actually uses his shield to stop right. And you can see he was trying to attack his back there. I'm not sure if he succeeded, but what he tried was if, if you have to get to someone's back, you obviously can't strike them like this. It's not going to get there. But if you turn your wrist, this is similar to the Sturzhau or plunging cut in historical European martial arts, where you roll your wrist to perform a false edge cut. And in the SCA, you have that as well. They call it the wrap shot, which they also use to get around the opponent's shield. You can do this particularly well with strongly curved sabers because they reach a lot better. So if you imagine you're holding a shield in front of you, this way I would strike the shield, but this way I curve around it. These two are cautiously approaching as they get into measure and then it turns into a slugfest. Uh, let's see that again. That's the, diff the dangerous part. Whenever you get into a distance where you can reach the other with just an arm action without having to step in, that's when it becomes very dangerous because everything happens quickly. You have very little time to see it coming and respond correctly to defend yourself. So that lands on the shield. Boom, again on the shield. So it looks like the fighter on the right actually caught everything, which is pretty amazing. This, this is not easy. All right. Okay, trying to make himself a smaller target. Grappling, and there was another wrap shot there. If that hit, I'm not sure. But uh, he also... He also got control of the opponent's weapon there. So if we look at this again, right moves in, 
controls left arm, you know, with the shield and stick. And then he tries to get around, still controlling his opponent's weapons. And then he tries to sneak around the defense, which I think the other guy caught. So these two have quite a different fighting style compared to the others. You know, they tend to go in close quarters, tend to grapple a lot, tend to try to control the opponent's weapons and, you know, strike around, try to get the back. So regardless of style, different fighters have their own personality and their you know, own <laughs> methods like hit and run, for example. And hit and run is definitely not a bad idea here, since the guy on the left is significantly shorter and you know, smaller stature overall. So he definitely wants to you know, bet on agility and trying to stay safe. He's very, very cautious here. Doesn't want to just rush in. Plays it very strategically. And is just trying to yeah, faint the other guy out. He basically, he's trying to provoke a response that he can then capitalize on. But both are pretty defensive, so not that much happening until, there we go. So who actually landed a hit? I couldn't even see that. Okay, so he, he was trying to faint, I think. You know, gonna provoke a response by moving his, his shield forward so he can then strike with a stick. The other guy did cover up, but was also still able to catch it. Okay, these two have, again, a different style. I'm trying to faint him out. Okay, that was interesting. So as right moves in, looks like left is trying to stop him you know, with a kick or really more of a push to the other guy's leg to try to trip him up, but that actually backfires. He himself falls down, but at least as he falls, he evades the swing. So that's good. It's not always bad to end up on the ground. Uh, usually it is, but there are situations where as long as you keep covering yourself and, and as long as you get back up as quickly as you can. It's not necessarily that big of a deal. We had that feint he didn't buy. They're both a little more cautious even compared to the way they fought before. I mean, it's certainly painful lessons that, that you would get from this, I imagine. Okay, so both strike at the same time, I think. Yeah, left is Hitting right on the leg, it looks like, and right is hitting left in the in the torso at the same time. And then this this strike, I don't think is hitting. Oh, did he get him on the? Yes, he got him on the forearm there. Ouch! Yeah, that's gotta hurt. Let's move on to sharp weapons. What about machetes? I don't have a steel machete right now, but I still have the prop from that one Halloween video. So, Haitian machete fencing, quite interesting. Uh, if you want to know more about it, there's a website called HaitianFencing.org, which gives you some information about this martial art. They also have a YouTube channel called the Haitian Machete Fencing Project. I'll link it down below again. Definitely check it out. I'll talk about some of the videos there. This was quite significant when Haitian slaves fought to liberate themselves at the turn of the 18th to the 19th century, and they didn't have enough guns to equip every resistance fighter. So there were a lot of machetes used. There is apparently the question how much European influence there was because a lot of uh, Haitians signed up for the French military and uh, fought in Napoleonic Wars. So they were exposed to uh, European fencing techniques. So how much of that is in this? Now, keep in mind, I'm not an expert on either the Napoleonic era or 
this martial art or Haitian history. But if I just look at some of the techniques, what it looks like, it actually resembles some medieval fighting more than Napoleonic saber fighting because there is a lot of blade on blade contact and you know maintaining that contact which is something that you see a lot in 133 for example which is sword and buckler but involves a lot of blade on blade contact and there are there are other medieval and renaissance traditions as well enough blah blah let's just take a look at it so note how much blade contact there is a prolonged blade contact they have to of course move away from a bind every now and then to cut but you see they often stay in contact that's we're going to talk about that a little more later let's just get a bit more of an impression of what it looks like they keep binding they keep trying to bypass the opponent's defense you know alternating between high and low attacks also going all the way low to the legs Keep switching from one side to the other, high to low, and they keep feeling for an opening in the opponent's defense. Now, since this is training, it could be that one has the role of the attacker primarily, and the other is supposed to mainly defend. You know, depending on what you want to focus on at the time, you can do drills like this or, or sort of one-sided sparring where one focuses more on one versus the other. You know, if you want to improve your defensive skills, it's good to just be constantly attacked and do nothing but focus on defense. So that could be what they're doing here. It seems like the guy on the left here is the one attacking and the other one defends. Okay, here you see that as well so always covering and wherever the opponent's machete is you move yours there as well the interesting thing here is the difference between this and European martial arts in the historical European manuscripts you have a lot of work from the bind with a long sword with a messer with all kinds of weapons really staff even halberd uh, because this is what keeps you very safe. I mean, as safe as you can be in a fight. There's obviously nothing safe about fighting with sharp blades. But as long as you maintain that bind, you're safer because you feel what's happening. If your opponent pushes in a certain direction, you know what's going on and, and you know how to respond to that. So as long as you you maintain contact, you're, you're safer. As, as soon as you leave that bind, that's when it becomes much more dangerous. Ideally, you want your edge against the opponent's flat because that allows you to push the opponent's weapon out of the way. It's one of the ways to get a mechanical advantage. But if you want to actually lock the blades, you would do it edge on edge because the edges bite and uh, so they they're not going to slide around if you bind flat on flat they might slide in this case they do use the flat it's a different approach so it's really more they they keep following the opponent's movement like they don't want it to be completely locked so basically they they reserve the option to leave the bind more easily at any given time because if you lock edges basically in order to leave the bind either you have to pull straight back or you have to turn the flat against it because you cannot you cannot slide the edges against one another but the flats you can so you can do different things there now sometimes you do see the edge against the flat or at least at an angle but yeah that's that's the interesting Part here. So this right here, I've never seen this elsewhere, definitely not in Hema or in another martial art where you try to cut basically at ankle height. So that is very unusual and this leads to having 
to move the blade all the way down. So I like that the primary focus here is on keeping yourself safe. Because that is very important. Machetes are not to be underestimated. They have a very wide blade and uh, sometimes they can be pretty thin. So even just a, a wrist cut can be pretty devastating, particularly if you're not wearing armor, maybe just light clothing, you know, in a hot climate, you know, thin t-shirt, things like that. The, the arms are bare. So even something like this would be a significant injury. So what you don't see right here is big sweeping cuts from the shoulder like this. And the reason is machetes are pretty quick, short weapons. Like the distance where you're at, you can't really get away with something like this. If somebody were to do this big telegraph swing, they would just step out of the way, cut to the arm and it's over. The forearm's probably flopping on the ground at that point. So this is just too risky, you know, just swinging like that, which is why there's a lot of blade on blade contact, a lot of work from the bind to keep safe, to try to sneak around the opponent's guard. A lot of footwork, a lot of circular movement. You can also see the experience there. Now on the left is the master, Alfred Avril, who unfortunately passed away in 2014. And uh, the guy on the right is putting in a lot more effort. You, you see like how, how much tension and dynamic movement there is. He's just kind of, he's just kind of walking around, just, just very relaxed, just controlling the, the opponent's machete. Because you can just tell that he's it's so, ingrained it's so natural to him when you know how to shorten down the movements and do them with the most mechanical efficiency and you know utilizing leverage and angles etc then you can save a lot of energy and you can do it in a pretty relaxed way but still be in control so this is fascinating to see Now, of course, this is in a, you know, in a friendly sparring situation, friendly practice. Uh, if he had to use this in a real fight, you bet he would be moving differently, you know, with more intent, more intensity. Anyway, I'll leave it at that for now. I don't want to make the video too long. Uh, again, check out the links in the description below. And uh, there's plenty of other cultures and fighting styles that are, would be interesting to look at. Uh, for example, uh, Kalari Payatu from India, I, I might take a look at and comment on. Um, I would really like to look into Maori fighting techniques. What I've found so far is mainly formalized demonstrations, basically like a kata. I haven't seen any sparring, but uh, if you have more information about that, let me know. Feel free to make any suggestions for specific styles or you know, events or, or what have you that you would like me to take a look at. And um, yeah, hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks.